So hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining this event from the various Meetup channels, a Weave Work user group, or from the GetUps community group. Hopefully you found us through one of those channels or through the Slack channels. We're very happy to have you here today. Um, if you are joining us new today or you're an existing member of our WeWe group, can you just pop it in the chat? Let us know where you're dialing in from. Let us know if it's evening, morning or afternoon. I like to be very interactive in the chats. So as I said before, my name is Vanessa Abankwa. I'm the Developer Experience Community Manager here at WeaveWorks, the company who coined the name GitOps and has created various projects, one of them being Flux. Hopefully you're an existing user. I'll have heard of the project before. We will be giving a special announcement tomorrow. So please check your socials and help us retweet. So today, we will be talking about Flux's security and scalability with OCI and Helm with our amazing open source engineer, Kindon Barrett. We will be so excited to see how many of you can join along, or if you have any questions, I will pop it in the, in the chat so you can follow along and be able to slack us after and lo ask loads of questions. We're a community here and we love communicating with our community. So I hope you're ready. So, as I said before, I work for a company named Weaveworks. A lot of what we do is based on open source. You might have heard of projects, like I mentioned earlier, such as Flux and Flagger, which we are in the INCIA, INC, sorry, Cloud Native Completing Foundation as incubated projects, but we might have some good news for you tomorrow, so please check on our socials. Flux was also a project which really kicked off the term GitOps. And it's been really cool to see loads of adopters of the projects and see how the community has grown over the last couple of years. So much so that large cloud vendors such as Microsoft, AWS, D2IQ, VMware, and others have adopted it and are using under the hood to offer GitOps to their com customers and their communities. We also have EKS Cuddle, which is built on top of um, AWS, and uh, which is so amazing about Flux. And if you're new to Flux, you will start to understand as we go through this talk, is we, we actually built Weave GitOps on top of Flux. And it's a free open source tool that provides GitOps to your various needs and has a UI built on top of Flux, which is amazing. We also have many, many more different projects. So if you're interested, definitely check us out on GitHub under WeaveWorks, as well as the CNCF, where you can find our projects. And obviously, of course, we are a company, so we have paid products and services like Flux Support. So if you're interested to learn more about those, please check us out on the website at weaveworks, weave.works, or reach out to me directly through Slack, or I'll pop some ways to connect through the chat as we go along. So just a bit of housekeeping, as I mentioned, we are having a talk today on OCI. So I've bookmarked this for 30 to 40 minutes um, session. I'm not sure I need to explain too much about Zoom these days, but I'd like to mention if you have any burning questions, Privately, just send it in the chat, chat, change everything to all attendees and panelists or everyone so we can all interact together. Finally, for me, we have a few great events coming up. Tomorrow, we have the HashiCorp user group where Priyanka Ravi will be talking about GitOps and Terraform. And our last event, of the year is implementing Flux with soft and multi-tenancy on the 13th of December. I will drop the links in the chat shortly. And yes, I'm so excited. Let me introduce Kingdon, my WOOG partner or WOOG OCI partner in crime. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, everybody. Thanks for introducing Hi. me. Thanks for everyone for coming today. I'm really glad to be here and i'll uh, share my screen and get started here so uh, make sure i'm on the right screen that is not the right screen one second all right maybe that was the right screen okay here we go um so 
if you joined us two weeks ago uh, for our Weave Online user group with Yozis Geigelos, um, you may re recall that we presented on GitOps, and we'll be presenting on GitOps again today. Uh, we are, uh, for anyone who's totally new, this is the start of your journey. Uh, welcome. Um, these are sort of the bullet points or 70,000 foot view of GitOps principles. Um, we're not going to cover that in a lot of depth. Let's just get into the topic here. So two weeks ago in uh, this video, which you can find if you have not seen it already, we demoed uh, Flux with OCI Bootstrap in quotes. Um, it's, I'm calling it Bootstrap Lite uh, because it's not an official thing yet. The OCI repository support is certainly official, but this particular structure is uh, sort of a non-standard configuration that we wanted to show uh, simply because you can do it this way and it's new. Uh, so we wanted to show uh, all of the possibilities. Um, so PodInfo was deployed as an app uh, managed via Git. We still use Git. Um, we also used an OCI repository for the root source of truth uh, or the bootstrap repo, which is the non-standard part. And what we're uh, also we've done, we've used PodInfo uh, as sort of a stand in for the upstream that we can't control. So uh, say they don't publish an OCI repository uh, just to understand that there's no hard switch you have to make. You can use Git and OCI together in uh, various configurations. So today is part two of this series. Uh, and just to elaborate a little bit on how the addition of OCI changes or doesn't necessarily change things. Uh, just to be clear, this is still GitOps, even with the addition of the OCI re repository. Um, it's still GitOps in every way. Uh, what we have here is a new opportunity. Uh, when we add this step, we have new opportunities for validation and all the other things that you might want to do in CI. Uh, so while this looks slightly different, uh, if you're an app developer, it's not really different because we've always had this step. Uh, we, we have CI in uh, responsibility of building images, whether they're app images or different kind of image. In Flux's case, uh, OCI repository manifest image with our YAML manifests in it. Anyway, let's just go and have a look at the official GitOps principles to make sure we haven't broken anything. Uh, we have declarative resources, the YAML, that goes into the version and immutable store, OCI repository, also versioned and immutable, gets pulled into the cluster, same as it was before. Uh, Flux sits in the cluster and runs on a continuous loop, reconciling from sources um, into the cluster. So those sources are the trusted sources, and we're going to see how we can make them slightly more trusted. Let's see uh, in brief. What are we going to see today? So this is the short version. Uh, we'll get into more details as we go on. But um, all right, so we have a cluster here. And it has a few resources on it, a few fewer than last time, actually. Um, this is a simplified Flux installation that only has, um, here we can see it. Uh, well, it, it is supposed to only have, we'll see uh, the next version only has Helm controller and source controller. So we're not going to use the customized controller or notification controller today. And we see a Helm release, PodInfo, um, which if we go in and inspect the uh, definition of that Helm release, we see the spec has the important parts. And one of those parts is verify provider cosign. So this is the spec uh, for the chart, which we'll see in a moment, has verified um, here we go. Here's our Helm chart source. Um, and if we look at it, we're going to go not into the spec this time, uh, but in the status where we can see the conditions that Flux has applied as it's worked on this resource. So one of the conditions we can see is this source verified condition that says that Flux has inspected this tag, it's inspected the signature, and the signature is indeed valid. Uh, so that's great. So that's what we're going to show in a little bit more detail today as we move on. Um, so let's go back to 
our presenter view here. So hopefully that was helpful uh, for anyone who's not exactly sure why you're here or already uh, today. Hopefully you are reasonably sure why you're here uh, because of the security and scalability benefits of OCI that we talked about last time. And this uh, slide should be familiar if you saw the presentation two weeks ago, so we're not going to belabor. Uh, but when we say that there are opportunities, um, CI can run tests. So all right, so this stuff is great means we can get guarantees that we haven't had before uh, or guarantees that we have maybe had, but we've had to make some special arrangements to get, like say a protected branch policy and mandatory checks on merges. Now you should still do those things, of course, um, but in production, how do we know that those protections were in place? Well, uh, you unfortunately, you can't know. Uh, you just have to trust, at least until now, if I understand correctly, uh, what we're showing today, you now you have a different option. So, all right, to recap again, last time, here's what we did. We did image verification with cosine. And, uh, we uh, highlighted two different types of images. We did not show uh, verification of app runtime images, uh, but we did show how to publish your YAML manifests as OCI artifacts and uh, sign them and verify them, etc. So uh, we, we added a public key to the cluster and we used it to prove the manifests were signed with our private key that uh, we added to the CI infrastructure with uh, cosine CLI. So this proves that the release is signed by CI as long as we've kept that key secure. Uh, this time we're going to do uh, things a little bit differently. So uh, like I said, last time we used OCI on the top and Git on the bottom uh, maybe it makes a little bit more sense if we do it the other way uh, because we can use git uh, for our cluster we can put yaml manifests in there keep the repository lean and it will be a repository that's just for clusters call that the fleet repo and then uh, the only complicating part is how to deploy our apps and we want to avoid trying to add a bunch of git repositories to the cluster uh, because each of those is, is re relatively heavy weight and other reasons that we'll see as we talk through uh, the example. So, and there's a bonus also, uh, if you are interested in verifying images at runtime in your cluster before they start running, we'll see how you can do that with Gavrel. Uh, so why did we choose cosine again? Uh, these are um, in brief, some good reasons to choose cosine. It's an open source security foundation sponsored project with support for OIDC and a public ledger for signatures where you can see uh, signatures as they're published and see when they were published and by whom. Um, so container registries have to have some support for signed images and GitHub offers a simple way to get started uh, with OCI and Cosign. So that is another reason why we chose Cosign. Um, so defense in depth is, is part of the reason for solutions like Cosine and why we choose solutions like Cosine. Um, and what I want to highlight at this point is that we don't uh, want to depend on a single solution. Um, we have what's called the Swiss cheese strategy in security uh, planning. So we always have to anticipate that there will be a hole in a layer somewhere of our security plan. There will be a gap. Um, that maybe we won't be aware of until it's too late. But the other layers in our security plan will help us enhance the probability of blocking attacks. So we want to have multiple mitigations for risks that we're aware of or we become aware of through risk assessment. And we want to have multiple overlapping protections. So that's why we don't just verify the, um, we don't only verify the YAML manifests or only the app image, we can do both and get additional protection from that. So what does this mean um, for us in uh, defense in depth and how we should apply it in our applications or production? Uh, well, it means that a lot of the traditional approaches of course still apply. You should use a protected main branch and you should use CI checks, some of which are mandatory to merge or all of which. And you should use immutable artifacts wherever possible this requires sometimes support from your container registry. Uh, not all container registries support immutable images, so this may or may not be available to you. 
Um, and there are new approaches that we can add now that help uh, solidify the security posture. We can add signatures and verifications at various locations. Okay, so that's our defense in depth plan. Uh, so these are the tools that we'll be using, not to skip over anyone. Um, and we're also going to give, uh, for container registries, we're going to give Harbor an honorable mention here because uh, Harbor, you can use this self-hosted and uh, it has a lot of nice features related to Cosign. Uh, but we're using GitHub Container Registry for uh, convenience all around and ease of use and a couple of benefits that we're going to talk about momentarily. Uh, so why Helm? Uh, why, why would you use Helm? The number one reason is uh, its ubiquity. It's uh, simply the most popular approach to distribute your applications on Kubernetes. If you are a vendor and you publish an application, you are almost certainly doing it as a Helm chart, unless you have a very specific reason not to use Helm. Uh, people expect Helm charts, and there are lots of nice features that help understand why they expect Helm charts, including separating your configuration from your artifacts and allowing uh, lifecycle hooks for things such as a database migration. So uh, let's not belabor this. Uh, Helm has some limitations and we're not going to talk about them in depth, but um, we have chosen Helm. And we have chosen to use Helm with Helm controller, which mitigates a lot of the uh, limitations. One in particular that's not going to be important for us today, but uh, that Helm itself does not natively support operating CRDs. So through uh, Flux's Helm controller, you can in fact upgrade CRDs in a, in a sensible way. And uh, when a failure occurs in a release, uh, there are configuration options for remediation. So these are features that are not natively available in Helm. And of course, uh, cosine verification uh, that also, so Helm and GitOps together, uh, Flux is implementing this. So Helm can be used declaratively. Uh, Cosine we're using because it's popular, uh, it's new, and because um, it has a promise to solve a problem that others before it could not solve, and that problem is adoption. Uh, so I have a question for the audience at this point. I would like to know how many people uh, are in fact signing your releases uh, right now. Um, I still have uh, some questions about keyless verification myself. I want to know more about how it works. I want to understand what it proves. Um, these are questions that are above my pay grade for right now. Uh, if you could pop in the chat, if you are or are not signing your releases right now, that would be wonderful. Um, but to get to the point, I am expecting a common answer is going to be no. Uh, we do not sign our releases and we have not considered doing so for a long time. Um, so I think I think that key management is really the biggest obstacle. If you can move to sign your releases without making a new difficult key, ma key management problem for yourself, well, that's forward progress. And that's my little elevator pitch for uh, keyless cosign right now. Um, Helm has had support for verified releases since forever, but um, just checking the chat here to see. Uh, nope, no, we are not. No, not yet. Okay, so. Helm has had support for signature verification forever, uh, but uh, nobody verifies their releases except for maybe very few publishers. And even more, nobody checks signatures of projects that are released. Uh, why, do, why do we think this is? Is it because we don't understand the benefits of signature verification or is it because uh, of the keys and the hassle of managing keys? Um, we don't really have a good way to rotate keys, maybe, or we don't have a way to revoke keys, and we don't have a good way to verify that keys are valid or that they're appropriately owned. Um, so how do you get the developer's key, uh, public key, and how do you assert that it's trustworthy and that the private part is securely stored? Uh, all of those are very hard to prove. And also, what does it get you? Um, you know that it's signed. Hopefully, that means that it's trustworthy. Uh, those are all sort of problems that are in the scope of projects like Cosign to solve. And I think I would love to have uh, someone like someone from Sigstor on uh, maybe on a WOOG sometime or in another venue where we could talk about the gaps uh, in my understanding, because as I have to admit right now, I do not know all the details. But if you aren't signing releases now at all, uh, can it really be worse than what you're doing today? So Cosign provides that capability in a transparent way that does not require key management. 
um, and our Git repository provides a good deal of support for that as well, somewhat indirectly, uh, but very well uh, as it is a full-featured OIDC provider. And I guess that's what we needed here, a native OIDC capability with support for the features that Cosign needs. And GitHub uh, Actions, one of the themes of Flux to security is environment-driven or context-based authentication. So ideally, you do not handle keys, um, any keys at all, except for those that have been generated for you into your environment, and they're rot rotated automatically for you. So uh, with GitHub Actions, we get access to all that. Each new CI runner has a scoped configurable token that identifies it and authorizes it to do things like um, writing to the package reg registry. Uh, so when our actions are done, we can publish the container image uh, or the manifest image or the Helm charts or both or all of those to a container registry and publish the signatures there. So with those signatures, we can make attestations to prove that our releases meet the valid release criteria. So let's see some of that in action and we'll, we'll come back here again for the other details. All right, um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to tear down my cluster and we're going to have a little interlude here um, for vCluster. This is a plug for another open source project. Uh, what you can see here is if I switch to my parent cluster that I have a number of V clusters. Uh, a V cluster um, I'm not going to go into detail about what vCluster is or how it works, but it's a very lightweight tool for virtualizing clusters. You can find out more about it on uh, vCluster's website. And the main way for people to use vCluster is this vCluster CLI. Um, but we're using, actually today instead, we are using... Um, where did it go? We're using the cluster API. And I've lost the link here, but there is a link, um, Cappy Cluster API Provider. Here we go. There it is. So if you'd like to follow exactly what I'm doing, you can follow these docs to install the Cluster API Provider. But it's not important what cluster we're using just now. A kind cluster will be fine if that's what you're using. Um, so let's delete this cluster. V cluster, V cluster. I have definitions for all of my clusters here. And let's apply that definition again and let's just take a look at it while we wait for things to happen. So uh, what Cluster API allows us to do, it allows us to use a declarative definition of our clusters so that we can make them reproducible. Uh, so this cluster has a little bit of configuration here I wanted a particular Kubernetes version. I wanted uh, to name a control plane endpoint that I've set up with DNS. So there's an IP address here that maps to a load balancer. So this cluster will be accessible inside my network, even if I'm not on the same machine that it's running on, uh, which I'm not. And I'm just going to apply that. First, let's see that the cluster has in fact been deleted We'll apply the definition again, and we'll just give it a moment to catch up uh, with that. We should see any moment now the cluster API provider uh, kicking into life and creating our new V cluster, same as the old V cluster. Okay, uh, so that is V cluster. Now we need to connect to our vCluster since it's ready. And I'm going to skip a step here if I forget. Uh, don't forget. Let's see. I want to delete my old kubeconfig. I'm using this tool called kconf, which is really neat. Uh, it just gives you a little bit more um, oomph when you try to edit your kubeconfig file. So I want to rename that so my prompt is not so gnarly and switch back to my new cluster and hopefully everything is okay. All right, we have a new cluster courtesy of vCluster and Cluster API. Wonderful. 
All right, I'm just gonna pull this out of the way. I don't need this. All right, so what we're gonna do now, we're going to follow the directions from this repository. Uh, this is a repository for the demo that we're given right now with some directions in case uh, you're not following the video later and you want to do this on your own. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is prepare an empty cluster as we've done and then we're going to visit these instructions uh, from pod info about continuous delivery. Uh, so these instructions explain how you can install a, a slightly stripped down version of Flux that only has the source controller and the helm controller no customized controller. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and do that. We have already installed the Flux CLI. You'll need to do that first if you haven't done that. And we run here that and we should see um, if we refresh this we should see that we have some Fluxes now. Let's see, there they are. Okay, that's great. Uh, but we have no sources and no workloads because we haven't bootstrapped and we in fact we can't bootstrap because we have no customized controller uh, we could but we would be undoing what we've just done which is the stripped down installation so we're going to use kubectl apply a little bit more in this demo than we normally would um, if you're new to GitOps, uh, just understand that this is a simplification so we only have fewer things to talk about at once so uh, normally what you would be doing is committing files into a Git repository and pushing them up and letting Flux apply them. But we want to take a couple of steps out of the process so we can focus on what we're doing. So we have this uh, clone of the repo that I just showed. This is the uh, Flux OCI demo November 29 repo. And in this solution folder, we're not going to look at what's in there uh, because it's the solution and we're working through the solution right now okay so first we've done flex install and now we're gonna create a source according to these instructions alright and I'm gonna do one extra thing after I do that I'm going to run this again with dash dash export so we can see what we're creating I'm also going to uh, echo this out into the work directory so this is work podinfohelm repo.yaml. All right, so I've created it on the cluster and I created it in the file system. Now we're going to follow the next step. I'm going to go into the work directory here because it's going to create a file in the local directory. These are our values. If you're new to Helm controller, uh, values are common in Helm as a way to configure your Helm chart. Um, so we've got a few values that we can set here to add memory or reduce the memory to a limited amount and uh, request some CPU. Um, hopefully those are fairly familiar if you're not new to Kubernetes uh, or if you are, hopefully that made sense. All right, and then we're gonna create uh, Helm release based on that in the cluster. So we're taking that podinfo values.yaml file as input. We're using it to generate Helm release. And then we're going to do the same thing that we've done before, uh, which is dash dash export so we can see what we've done. And um, we're going to capture that into a file so we have it. Okay, so what we have right now, let's go back to our visualization. We should see that we have one source and one workload. And uh, if we go in and inspect the Helm repository, we can see um, the spec is exactly as we've written. It's using an HTTPS link here. Um, so uh, this is the inefficient old style of Helm repository. Uh, I apologize for this error down here. Hopefully you don't get that error, uh, but it doesn't seem to get in the way for me. Um, we'll fix it eventually. Uh, so, so this is um, 
your standard uh, HTTP Helm repository. It uses an old style index.yaml that has all of the content, all of the metadata for all of the releases. It's very expensive to download it every time you want to see if there's a new release. Um, OCI repository is more efficient. So first we're going to switch what we've done to that style. Um, and actually we're going to do one more thing first. If you're uh, not that familiar with customize, what this does is it looks through the current directory for any files that are valid Kubernetes resources and it creates this list of those files. So we can see that we have two files that are valid and we have one that is not, that is .info values.yaml. So that one is excluded because it's not a Kubernetes resource. It's part of our uh, buildup and it, it's obviously not valid to customize. So it's just skipping over that. And we've done that so that we can kubectl apply-k from the work directory and get, um, we can ignore those errors. They don't mean anything to us right now. Sorry about that, but uh, okay. So every time we make a change in the work directory, we're going to apply it and we're going to be able to see the difference on the cluster. And if we bootstrap flux, uh, we could skip that step, but anyway, let's just proceed. So we made our files in the work directory, we created and we applied them. And now uh, we want to get, uh, before I get anything here, this is going to fail, unfortunately, because I'm using vCluster, um, uh, custom resource definitions include uh, these ones that we don't want and they conflict with our flux CRDs. So we're just going to delete those. Get them out of the way. And then we are going to try again and be a little specific. All right, and we actually do get uh, our pod info chart. So this chart is created from the Helm repository, and this is a little bit different model than what you get if you're using a Git repository, uh, because the Helm chart itself is an artifact uh, that maps to a particular version, and we don't have anything equivalent to that in the Git repository or in the OCI repository. Um, so so uh, Helm chart, that's maybe uh, unnecessary detail right now, so let's um, get down to business. We're going to convert this into an OCI repository. Not an OCI repository, exactly, uh, but we're going to convert it into an OCI Helm repository. Okay, so we need to add a few things. We need to add this type modifier here, and we need to fix the URL. OCI All right, so it lives in Stefan Prodan slash charts. And um, we're going to change one other thing because the structure is slightly different. So this is pod info charts, and the chart is named pod info in this repository. So that is going to be important in a moment. And here's our Helm release. Here's where it's important. We have to make sure that we call it pod info charts. And we um, that's the wrong place. I did that in the prep too. It's actually down here. Put it right there. And we have to add one other thing to the spec here. I'm going to borrow this from a blog post. Uh, sorry, blog OCI Helm. So because this is a little bit deep in the YAML, this one is really obvious. It goes right under spec. Um, but this one is not so obvious. By the way, I just sort of pulled this up uh, without explaining where I was going. This is one of the blog articles on the Flux website about our new OCI support. Uh, and you should definitely check out this series. We have the links that we'll show later. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the part that we need. Um, there is a piece here that explains what we're doing. We're going to use YQ to modify our YAML in place. Um, we're going to add 
this verify provider cosine to the chart. And we saw that before, uh, but the important thing to note is that it actually goes in here in the chart spec, not in the Helm release spec, uh, because it will be part of our Helm chart later, as we saw. So let's do that. And we're not using Prometheus Helm release here. This is work pod info Helm release. And let's see, did that work? Oh, I have to overwrite the file. Did that still not work? No. All right. Forget YQ, we're just gonna copy this in there before we lose everything. <laughs> All right, so that's what we're adding, this verify provider cosine. And yes, we wanna overwrite rather than lose our work. And I think that is it. So let's apply. Okay. And we should be able to see relatively quickly things happening. Hopefully we catch it in an intermediate state while it's still loading. Yes, we did. Uh, chart not ready. Okay. Did we forget something? It still says chart not ready. Let's see. So here's our OCI chart says the Helm repository is ready. Maybe we just need to reconcile this again. Yes, it looks like that was it. Okay. Now we're going to edit our chart again. And we can see this time we do have the verify uh, tag in our spec. And if we go back down here, we do find that it has verified a signature. Okay, so um, there's a few things I want to talk about before we go back to the slides. Uh, one thing about this that gives me a little bit of apprehension is I don't really understand what this proves. Um, I'm afraid that if someone compromised um, my GitHub container registry and they could write to it, then there would really be nothing standing in the way of them producing signatures and publishing them as well. Uh, so that is why I believe um, there are a few things that you need to know about Cosign before you try to implement this as a replacement for whatever you're already doing to sign releases. Um, and, and if you're not signing releases, then uh, you can work those things out later. Uh, just get started, just try it. Uh, but the first thing I want to highlight is that this is a signature on a tag. And uh, if you go through the cosine instructions and uh, produce this signature yourself, and by the way, uh, I want to highlight exactly how this is done in the PodInfo source. Um, so we have under GitHub workflows, we have a release workflow that covers not only keyless, but also keyful signing or keyed signing. Um, so here you see this cosine experimental flag. And I believe that this cosine experimental flag is, I haven't spoken with anyone at SIGSTORE to understand exactly why this is marked experimental, but I think that it is largely uh, due to the question that I just asked is, what does it prove? Uh, we need to make sure that people understand what it proves and how they can get the guarantees that they're looking for from a keyless signature. Uh, because you, um, if you're using an old traditional keyed signature, like we're doing uh, down here for the release, well, we had a key. And we put the key in a file, and we used cosine with the key to sign. So there is a public part. A counterpart to that key 
that people can use to verify that it was signed with that key. So what do we actually get when we sign something uh, using an OIDC token? Uh, well, we can maybe prove where it was produced and when, and uh, maybe if we look into the details of that a little bit more, we'll see that there are more things we can prove. Uh, but right now, we just want to get past it and say, all right, we've signed our releases now and we can use signatures. And that's what we've done here. So, okay, so we confirm that our OCI repository still works. Here we sort of merge these two steps into one. Um, we switch to the OCI repository and we added keyless signature verification. Um, this proves that it's signed. I'm not sure what else it proves, but this is a great progress if we have not been signing our releases up until now. Uh, we may not have secured the entire pipeline. We're not um, verifying, for example, that uh, the application image itself is signed, um, but we can show, let's go back to the slides actually for that because we have a few notes about that. Uh, do we have questions at this point, maybe before I move back on uh, that we can address? Anybody have any questions up until now? Uh, anybody have any reactions? Maybe that that be another question I can ask. So uh, while we wait for those to come in, let's go back to the notes. Where did they go? Okay. So this is the link to the example repo that we just showed um, with the solutions. And a reminder that we haven't used uh, GitOps directly here. So this is not bootstrapped. It's, um, yeah, OK. So the question, how to verify a key, keyless signature? Uh, I think that we'll get to that in a moment um, when we talk about. So here are how to produce the signatures. Um, as we mentioned. There are two sections in here, and I've highlighted them separately. Maybe this would be a good point to actually go and visit those so you can see what we're highlighting. So this is the experimental cosine keyless. This is how you create a keyless signature and how to verify it. Uh, if you want to verify it directly, you can verify it through the cosine CLI. I don't think there's an example of that here. Cosine verify, though, is the command that you want to use. Uh, so here is verify with a key, and I'm uh, fairly certain that if you do the same trick with without a key and with the experimental option turned on like this, then you'll get a, a verify uh, over the experimental keyless. So here, here is exactly how uh, the details of how to use keyless signatures and cosine and some more notes about digests uh, also. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to mention when we sh showed uh, the tags being signed is cosine will warn you if you do it that way because cosine has no way to know that you have a um, immutable registry where the tag that you just pushed is the tag that you just downloaded and it's guaranteed. Uh, and in fact, cosine probably would rather that you didn't depend on that. So what we're not doing in this release process, uh, but if anybody is really interested, I can share the script that I have. Um, what we're not doing is we're not extracting the um, digest from the output here, the flux push artifact and flux tag artifact both output a digest that let you know what has been pushed. And uh, that is actually what you should sign according to cosine. Uh, but we, it's, it's okay, I think, for this example to sign the tag, even though there's a slight chance that it's been moved out from under us uh, because we can show this as an example and, and show um, that there's a better alternative also. So uh, that's, that's what's explained here with image digest. Um, okay, so that's pod info. And here is the keyed signature in case you were curious uh, where the only difference is we actually pass in a key uh, to the sign command and a password since the key is encrypted 
Um, so we need the password to decrypt the key so we can sign the release. And uh, we also sign the latest tag here. So, um, so that's pod info. Here are some links from the Flux blog that um, I want to make sure that everybody has. And uh, we have copious documentation about how OCI and Cosine can be used together. Um, and the security docs also, uh, which highlight some of the important OCI features that I mentioned before. Uh, this one about contextual authorization is important. This is uh, the environment-based configuration that I mentioned, and uh, Yoz has covered in a little bit more detail when he was talking about it. Um, basically, the idea is that you don't want to handle secrets if you can avoid it. So set up your environments so that they provide you with what you need and use the secrets in the context or in the environment. And then uh, if you do have to handle secrets, there is a great guide on how to handle secrets and how to use them in Flux with all of the features of Flux. Um, so there are different spins on how to handle secrets, and we've tried to cover them all in here. So go ahead and check that out. And also um, just highlight our docs in general are, are really comprehensive. There are a lot of guides and use cases um, that the list is somewhat intimidating, but if you're looking for something in particular, um, please do have a look through because we've covered a lot and hopefully it's covered in there. Um, all right, Caverno. I mentioned that Caverno can be used to verify images at runtime. Um, so here's how you do that. Follow this link for verifying image attestations. And I think that if you follow this, we'll answer some of the questions about what does it get us? What does it prove uh, that it has a keyless signature? How do we know that it's trustworthy? Uh, what can we trust it for? Um, but this cluster policy resource, if you create it, push your public key uh, in, you can verify images using Cosign this way. So, uh, so that is great. And I want to also mention just to call out that Caverno is one of the CNCF projects that's been the most supportive of Flux long term in the history of um, projects that Flux has worked with on various things. You can see here there's actually some uh, Caverno docs about features uh, that relate directly to Flux and how you can use them with Flux. So Caverno is also in the Flux multi-tenancy guide. Um, make sure that we show people that. Flux 2 multi-tenancy. I didn't include this link in the slides, but this guide covers installation of Caverno and some use of the docs that we've just shown. And Caverno itself also uses uh, Flux and Cosine in their release pipeline, which is great. Uh, this is another example that you can follow. So if you want to try um, cosigning your release, you can follow the example of Caverno just like you can follow ours. And it's a little bit different. Everybody's release pipeline is going to be a little bit different, but um, the general idea is the same. So who else is using Cosign today in their release process? Uh, well, the Prometheus community now also does. Uh, if you go and check out the Cube Prometheus stack chart, I'm just going to close some of these tabs so we can see what I'm talking about. Cube Prometheus stack is used by the Flux Monitoring Guide. And if you go into the releases here, you can see that Cube Prometheus stack is in fact publishing a signed chart to OCI, which is great uh, because that means we can use it in the Flux Monitoring Guide. Um, so if you follow the link to the Flux Monitoring Guide, you will find now um, oh, my mistake, OCI. I thought that it was already updated here, but it looks like it's not. Um, we'll have to come back and fix that. By the time you watch this on recording, it should be fixed, hopefully. Uh, so the Flux Monitoring Guide will also provide uh, instructions on how to install a chart using OCI and Cosine. So that's great. Um, and who else is using Cosign? Uh, well, Cert Manager also does. So this is a star-studded list um, of prominent open source uh, and CNCF projects that are 
uh, adopting this standard. Uh, and also Harbor uh, provides a different kind of support. Uh, I mentioned earlier, well, it looks like they're not actually publishing OCI images or signatures as far as I can tell, uh, but maybe I missed them somewhere. Uh, but the fact is, if you are using Harbor, then you can uh, already enjoy cosine verification in the UI, as you can see the attestations and verify the signatures in the Harbor UI. Uh, so we got a question from Matthew. Uh, does anyone from Flux have ever tried OCI chart and cosine with a Nexus repository manager? Um, I have not tried that. I don't know if it will work or not. Uh, but if it's OCI compliant, it should work. Uh, I can tell you that we went to some lengths before Docker Hub announced that they would be fully supporting OCI in the uh, very near future. We went to some lengths to ensure that it was still usable with uh, Docker Hub. So my expectation is if there are any curveballs from the Nexus Artifact Repository Manager, then uh, they probably will be covered by that. Uh, but I do not know the answer for sure. So. Um, if anyone in the chat has tried that, that would be great if we can hear about that. Um, so adoption is coming, um, and this is a new feature. Uh, okay, so adoption is slow, but it is coming, and you can help. Uh, you, you can help by trying out this workflow and reporting any issues that you may have. Um, go ahead and complain if something does not work up to your expectations. Please respectfully, of course, uh, for a community of committed volunteers who are interested in your pain. Um, and uh, lastly, we have a few other slides, uh, but we, if we have room for questions, um, and if you have any questions at this point, we're pretty much uh, out of content, out of time. So um, the last few slides are, uh, we have a plug for uh, GitOps tools, the VS Code extension that we saw in use. Uh, this is something that I've been working on with Yozis for a while, and uh, with some other developers as well. And uh, this is a very useful way to help simplify your development environment and minimize context switching. So if you have access to your cluster directly, this is very useful um, to see the state of things as they are in the cluster without switching to a terminal and using the Flux CLI, you can just find that information directly in your editor. Uh, please check out the pre-release uh, if you're using this today. There are a few issues that haven't been fixed in the main branch. All the action happens on the pre-release branch. We should have another regular release soon, though, so um, check that out. And also uh, plug for Weave GitOps, which we did not see today, uh, but Weave GitOps provides an intuitive interface that uh, is open source, and it's designed to give you a uh, sort of guided experience to help you build up your understanding in a different way. Um, so it's supposed to be a little bit more turnkey, I think, is the, uh, the way that I would describe how this works. So if you are new to Flux, if you're entirely new to Flux, we hope that you would have a good experience through either of these entry points, uh, at least as good as the experience that you would have going directly uh, to the Flux docs, fluxcd.io. And uh, that is our, our presentation for today. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Um, Vanessa, if you're still here, do you wanna close us out? Sure, thank you Kingdon so much. It was really insightful. For all those who have questions, please follow us on our Slack channels, follow us on WeWorks on GitHub and our Flux GitHub channel also. And we look forward to seeing you. And don't forget tomorrow's event, HashuCorp, and also on the join us again on the 13th for soft multi-tenancy. Thank you. Thank you, Kingdom. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks everyone for joining.